Come on, his mercy and goodness shall follow me all the days of my life. Anybody thankful for his goodness here today? He's been too good to me. I can't tell it all. Amen, amen. Thank you, uh, praise team, for... Man, I feel the presence of the Lord here today, don't you? On a Wednesday night, amen. Souls were baptized on Easter Sunday. I think, I think we're in revival, aren't we? Amen, amen. If you can uh, remain standing with me and turn to the uh, First Samuel uh, chapter 17 and verse 49. While you're turning there, I want to give honor where honor is due. Give honor to my pastor here today. That is, I believe, is out of town, uh, but I honor him and the first lady of this church. Aren't you thankful for your pastors? And uh, give honor to the ministry and the sanctuary and give honor to this church. Uh, the Anchor Church, there's not a church like it. Amen. Amen. Um, Verse 49 says, And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead. And that stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon the face, on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine. And slew him, but there was no sword in David's hand. Um, I want to preach to you about the sling and the rock. Um, The sling and the rock. I wonder if you could lay your Bibles down um, here tonight. And let's just uh, pray a blessing over this service and open your hearts towards heaven And uh, just lift your hands right now and just begin to open your spirit right now so the Lord can minister. God, we're thankful that we're in the house of God, and it's a privilege to be before your people. God, I pray that you anoint my mind and my spirit and my lips, Lord, to minister unto your people. And God, open the hearts of your people tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. If you believe that, clap your hands unto the Lord as you're seated and give the Lord some praise. Amen. You're, you may be seated. Um, my, my grandfather, uh, which I never met, was a World War II veteran and grew up in the sticks of Kentucky. Uh, you probably couldn't find it on the map. That's how deep it is in the sticks, as they say. And this man was uh, poor, as my, da- my daddy told me. I never met my grandfather. He actually passed away before my mother and dad were dating but um, he was uh, poor, a poor kid growing up, and, um, and because of some uh, trouble in the family, he ended up staying with his grandmother on the farm. And on that farm, because they were poor, every shot that they took with their guns uh, mattered. Amen. And it was, it was uh, you did not just waste ammo. You did not just have shooting practice. Uh, if you did not kill, you did not eat. And this is how my grandfather was raised. And eventually, when he became in his later teens, he enlisted and went into the army as infantry and uh, actually became one of the better shooters, if not the best shooter in basic training because of this repetitive um, 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 daily or weekly activity he participated in in his life and that was that he hunted for his food he didn't go to the grocery store he didn't pick it up on you know uh, um, the market on the on Maple Avenue get some vegetables he actually had to dig up cut down and shoot his prey and this was something over a period of time he began to uh, become an expert 
uh, marksman and, and knew how to shoot a rifle, knew when to and when not to. And it was when my father began to tell me these awesome stories of my grandfather and when he came back from the war, he was such a good shooter that he would be able to take a, a, a single card out of a deck and um, place it sideways and at a distance, split the card with the BB gun. That's how accurate this man was with the rifle. Um, but uh, these stories begin to brew inside of me as a young man. And, and my father one year had bought a long rifle, a pump action rifle. Uh, it was actually a BB rifle. And you would put the BB in and you would pump it up so the air would compress inside. And, and you know the rest, you just shoot the rifle. Well, I would go in the backyard and we had a, a little patch of woods in the backyard. And I would use cans, I would use um, cards, I would use targets, I would, I would shoot at the leaves and the trees. Uh, whatever I can set my eyes on, I would begin to shoot at. That could be dangerous for a young man. And I would, I would do that day after day, hoping, hoping, Brother Justino, I'd be as good as my grandfather one day and to split that card in half uh, sideways. But there was one day um, I was sitting down in the chair, and I looked to my right, and I, I see that we had a neighbor lady that lived right next door to the duplex I grew up in. And, and she had all kinds of animals that would come through that. They, she had a massive tree that she would, she would hang corn on. She would place uh, bird feed on, and, and she would have deer, you name it, it was there. And it was just on afternoon, probably on a weekend or after school, I was sitting there and I saw a squirrel upside down uh, getting its hands into that bird feed. And something came over me. My dad warned me, he said, son, you can't shoot any animals in her yard. She will call the police on us now. She was one of those people that, man, don't hurt animals, don't kill them, don't eat them, don't anything. And the rebellious teenager I was, I, that squirrel was taking his good old time, reaching in there, trying to find some bird seed. And I, I pumped that gun up. I comped the plate. I said, well, I'm, that's far than, farther than my normal targets are. That's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a distance. I'm just going to shoot it anyways because it's going to feel good. I'm pretty sure I won't hit that squirrel. As I begin to pump up the hardest I can, uh, so many reps into that, that, little, that little rifle, I aimed my sights on that squirrel, and I shot it. And as soon as I shot it, within a second, that squirrel fell to the ground. It did not move. My heart sunk to my stomach. I said, I'm going to jail. I'm, getting, I'm going to be on the front newspaper. This, she don't like us to begin with. And she's going to call the cops on us because I killed a squirrel in her yard. Well, that's not what happened. But anyways, I ran upstairs frantically, and I was just anxious. And as I'm walking up the steps, I was just amazed. Man, that's awesome. I killed a squirrel. And I walked up there, and my dad was in the bedroom. And, and I said, Dad, Dad, Dad. You wouldn't believe it. I killed a squirrel. He said, cool, son. Yeah, in the neighbor's yard. What? You take this shovel right now and go put that in the woods. So I ran down there and grabbed the shovel. And as I'm walking towards a squirrel, I noticed it began to still, it was still breathing. And I got instantly scared. And my shot was so good, matter of fact, that there was not to get graphic, but there was blood right between its eyes. I shot it dead between its eyes on its forehead. And as I began to touch it, it jumped up sideways and went into the woods. That's my story. But the point to the story is, as I'm walking up those steps, I was surprised that I shot it. And I shot it right on its head. But I would never got to that point if it wasn't for day by day of practice. You see, I read a book that, um, a book by a man that talked about habits and consistency. And sometimes as humans, we, we get 
we get frustrated because we try to be intentional on in making small changes in our life, whether it's day by day or week by week. Uh, but when we fail to see tangible results, and which can lead to a valley of discouragement, eventually our thoughts sometimes can convince us to stop practicing. Amen? To stop pursuing the goal that which we are trying to accomplish. And a quote from a book I read says, Complaining about not achieving success despite the working hard is like complaining about an ice cube not melting when you heated it from 25 degrees to 31 degrees. It's not that heating up that ice cube to 31 degrees was uh, in vain or your effort was in vain it was not that it all just was a fairy tale and everything that you set out to do was a failure but but your hard work here tonight is not wasted it's just being stored because all the action happens at 32 degrees amen all the action it can either freeze or it can either melt, but it was the consistency of increasing the temperature by degree by degree. And just like that day, I shot that squirrel and was surprised. As a matter of fact, I should not have been surprised because the days that I put in, day after day, shooting that BB gun, that it came one day that I shot it and I met my goal. And I come to tell you here tonight that you cannot be discouraged because of the journey that you're on or the goals that you set before you or what God has destined you to become or accomplish because every habit, every intention, everything you do that is small or big matters. It was David's responsibility to be a shepherd. He tended his father's sheep on the backside of the hills and as that, while his other brothers begin to hunt, build, and do the other bigger, quote-unquote, responsibilities given to them by Jesse. It was his job um, to take care of the sheep. He was to protect them because sheep lack self-defense. He was to feed them with quality food and lead them to places to graze. And he was to guide the herd together so none went astray and would be devoured by a predator or get lost and die from loneliness. He was to be present as a shepherd to develop a relationship with those sheep so they would trust him and obey his voice. David had the job that was secluded from everyone else, but in God's eyes, he had the best job. It was during that time of war that the Philistines and the Israelites were on one side of the mountain and there was a valley in between them. You can say that this was a stalemate. You can say that um, because of that, they were waiting for the first one to make a move because going down to the valley first or charging first would leave one side vulnerable to the other side. It was Goliath, the Philistine champion, that presented himself before the Israelites and, and willing to fight any man, he made a wage saying that if I if choose a challenger for me and if I defeat him, your people shall serve my people. Vice versa, if he defeats me, our people shall serve yours. And when he stepped on the battlefield, this mammoth of a man, he, he, the Israelites were dismayed and stricken with fear and scared and afraid because they did not know of a man that was going to challenge this champion. They did not know or hear of somebody that had an undefeated record that was willing to go before this Philistine. But it was David that was on the backside of his father's hill, a away from the family, away from the brethren, away from society, if I can say that God had preserved for a very particular moment in time that would become one of the greatest victories of God's people.
Meanwhile, during the stalemate, it was Jesse, David's father, that sent him uh, to his brethren, to his own brothers, to, to, uh, to bring a report back to, to dad to see how they were doing because three of the brothers went with Saul in the army and he wanted David to take some corn, take some loaves and some cheeses and I want you to go down there, David, and I want you to go see how they're doing and to give them the substance and their their um, their, their co-captains that are with them. Uh, David, I, I, I know that you're taking care of the sheep, but this is what I want you to do is to go down there in the trench. I don't want you to participate. I just want you to see what's going on so David to obey his earthly father took those cheeses those loaves and those corns and went down to the trench and saw his brothers and began to pursue them to salute them to see um, how they were going and as David gets closer the armies are shouting they are marching they are getting in position to get ready for somebody to go before Goliath and he recognizes the fear he recognizes the the, the, uh, the distractions the chaos the the confusion on everyone hiding themselves from this champion because they don't know who's going to go out they don't know if anyone has the courage to pursue Goliath. David hears the desperation. He hears what's going on. And something stirs on that young man's heart. Something begins to stir up. And, and he says to them, he says, he says, are you talking about this Philistine? This uncircumcised Philistine that defiles the armies of the living God? Is this the man? That is troubling all of our people. Is this the one that we've been worrying about days upon days? And as he, he saw this man, there's something that came on David that day. And there was a sense of confidence that came upon him that day. And he, and he thought and believed in himself that he may be the person to challenge this giant. And David, as he's talking amongst those men, his older brother Eliab uh, hears the annoying voice of his younger brother. And, and he tells David, David, why are you here? Why are you even here? You just came here to see the war because of the pride and the naughtiness in your heart. You didn't come here to help. You came here just to watch a, a monumental war. You just came here to be a part and to see. Can I take you in a flashback the moment that David was, was on the hill of his father's taking care of the sheep and the prophet Samuel came to the house of Jesse. It was on that day that the Lord said to Samuel, he says, I want you to go to Jesse's house and you shall anoint one of his sons. Let me pause here in the message and say that I want to highlight that God did not tell who he was going to anoint or what he looked like. What is that telling us? That means that God is not a respecter of who we are or what we seem to be or what we have uh, with us, but he's willing to anoint those according to a man's heart and not according to a man's stature. It's, it's, he was not worried about the name of a man or what the man had or the talents of, but he said give me a man that's taking care of his father's sheep and that's a man I can trust with kingdom duties <laughs> Samuel enters that house and when Samuel goes he sees and he looks at Eliab the oldest and he said to himself surely this is the man that the Lord wants to pick Surely he is. He's tall. He's got broad shoulders. He's fit. He's strong. He's wise. And he's smart. Everything on paper looks good. He checks every box off. This is the man. I'm convinced of it. I've had enough of Saul. And I'm, and I'm here. And, and if Saul even finds out, i got to make this really quick. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. i got to make this quick. i got to get in here because Saul, if he finds out that I'm in Jesse's house about to, to, to survey or to select a new king, he's going to kill me. 
Lord said, take a burnt sacrifice. And when he gets to the house, that Jesse, that his father, presents his, his, his boys to him. And the Lord challenged Samuel that day. And he says, no longer will I choose a man based off his stature. No longer will I choose a man based on the outward appearance. But I'm going to choose a man from my kingdom such as a time as this. Uh, based on the inside, the inner man, the motives, and the hearts of him. Can I tell you, if you're if your motives are to please the Lord, God can do anything with you. If your motives is just to serve and be faithful, that's who God is looking for. You don't have to have ten talents. You don't have to have five talents. All you need is one talent and be available to God. Come on, if you believe that, clap your hands. David, David, David. Whew. It was it was Saul that it was it was Samuel that went to Jesse's house and he said, Nope, that's not him, nope, that's not the son, no, that's not the man. I, I have not heard from God yet. And all the all the sons were passed through. They were all filtered out through uh, the selection process. Uh, uh, but but the interview was not done yet. He looked at Jesse, he said, Jesse, do you have anybody else? I know I heard from God. I know I was supposed to be at this house at this time. Do you have a, another son that I can anoint? But it was, he said, yes, I have a son that tendeth to the sheep. Can you imagine here today in the mind of David, he, he, it's recorded that he was an alien amongst his brethren. Oh, he was an alien amongst his mother's sons and he was a stranger amongst his brethren because of false pre, uh, um, uh, pre -known notion uh, between the mother and the father these sons did not even consider David as their own they did not even consider David as one of their own family members he came from a rejected place there was no peace bullied lied upon cheated but still found faithful serving his father Jesse and as he enters the house that day, the awkwardness. They've been there for a while, Elder. He's done, gone through all the family. And he sees his brethren. And his oldest sees it on the inside. And he notices David is the one that God has called to receive this anointing. It was intense atmospheres. It was an environment of hostility it was not easy but can I tell you in these last days God is going to give out a peer anointing to those uh, that come from broken places Come on, David was anointed two times. He was anointed in the midst of his brethren that had jealousy towards him. And he was anointed in the midst of his enemies that hated him. If you want to have anointing from God, you're going to have to go through some things. But there's got to be something on the inside that says, is there not a cause? Is there not a call to fulfill for God? Atmospheres of tension, cheated, lied upon, stressed, and tension. And, and, and in that environment, that's when God chose to anoint a man. Anointing breaks us so we can put our hands on broken people. You can't have anything stopping the anointing. God's not going to fill something that's not being willing to pour out. You found David serving his father day after day. The faithfulness of David going on the backside of the hill when no one could see, no one knew what his name was, but he found himself with that sling in that rock. He found himself learning day by day how to learn how to use that sling. He didn't learn it overnight. Can I preach to somebody? You won't get great overnight. You won't be something great overnight, but if you set your ways to 
to be consistent, to know the weapons that God has given you. If you set your ways towards God, he can take you places that you never thought he could. I can imagine some days David didn't want to wake up. There were some days David didn't want to wake up. He didn't want to get up early and attend the sheep. He didn't want to worry about another coyote or a bear or a lion. But he knew that all he had was a shepherd's sling. And all he had was some stones. And that's what he used to prepare a fight against the predators, against his father's sheep. There was days I'm sure that he missed. There was days I'm sure that there were some sheep that died and were dead when he woke up that morning. But each day he got stronger each day he got better each day he got more accurate can I tell you just gotta take it day by day I may not know how to pray today but tomorrow I'm gonna know how to pray I may not know how to fast today but next week I'll know how to fast I may not know how to teach a Bible study or knock on a door but I'm available and I'm willing I'm willing put your hands right now and begin to call in the name of the Lord Come on, I want to be willing, God. I want to be available. I want to be available. I want to be available. David, David. Eliab, what now? What now? Why, why, why right now? We're in the midst of a war and you're going to... You're going to cause some false accusation towards me. Why do you bring this up? I'm not here just to see the fight. But, but if you would just hear me out, Eliab, I have something stirring on the inside. I, I just came here to drop off some cheese and loaves. I, I just came here to give you some corn. But the moment I saw that Philistine, oh, come on, somebody. The moment I saw someone attacking God's people, there was a cause pulling me. There, there was a spirit of God that... I said, David, all those days you protect your father's sheep, now it's your turn to protect my sheep. All those days you were lonely, you got to use that spirit, the same spirit that came upon you with the bear and the lion, you're going to use it against Goliath. <laughs> David, David presents himself before Saul. <clears throat> Being a wise man, excuse me. Being a wise man, he, he, he knows not to mention the sling and the stone. I find, I find it really ironic, and we'll get there. But he, 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 he knows not to mention that. It would have been an embarrassment. It really would have. You have all these people with this armor and these swords and these shields and these breastplates and these helmets and all the brass and whatever type of metal they were using that day. Um, If he would have mentioned that, he would have been laughed at and and scorned and, and just made fun of for years and years on end. But he knew. He knew. He was reminded by God. He said, I remember there was one day that a lion and a bear came. I remember that there was one special day because I made myself available. There was one day because I decided to be faithful and stick it out and endure. There was one day that the Spirit of God rested upon me and I took that bear and I took that lion by the beard and I smote him before the sheep and before my God. So he convinces Saul Saul Saul's desperate. Saul, he knows. No man has presented himself to challenge Goliath. It's been days, maybe weeks. Uh, they were at a standstill. Israelites are on that side of the mountain. The Philistines were on that side in the valley in between. Uh, it was a single combat tactic. One man you choose, uh, and I'll choose another man. And the man that wins, wins the war for his people. He was out of options. He... He, he, I'm not sure if he really believed David. He said, okay, go here, David. Go, go. But before you leave, I want you to take some armor of mine. I want you to take this armor and put it on you. And David respectfully de- declined the offer. The reason why David declined the altar is because David said, I did not prove these things. 
Why is that significance here today? It's because you got to use what God has given you at the time. Come on, you can't put things on you or begin to claim or, or use things that God has not given you jurisdiction to use. Belba, I come to tell somebody in the Holy Ghost, if God gave it to you, that's all you need to war. Come on, it may be insignificant. It may be a sling and just a simple rock. It may be a shepherd's bag. But if that's what God gave you, that's all you need. David knew if I put this armor on, it may, it may slow me in battle. It, 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 may, it may make me slow, and, and I'm not used to it. I'm used to that sling and that rock. I'm used to my own hands. Uh, he writes in the psalm, he said, Blessed the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war, and my fingers to fight, and make my feet as hinds feet. It, it was David that, that trusted in his private devotion towards God. Private victories lead to outstanding battles. Private victories that mama didn't see, your spouse didn't see, uh, your brother and your sister didn't see. Oh, closet moments. Oh, moments where you were broken and defeated and discouraged and, and afraid. Moments on a hill on a rainy day. Moments but you still decided to serve God and you still wanted to be available. It's in those moments that make you a warrior for God. It's not fasting three days out of the year. It's fasting consistently throughout the year. It's not going on a prayer bench for five days straight, call off work, take a vacation, it's the day-to-day -day prayer that you wake up every day and learn how to use that sling and that rock. When your baby cries in the middle of the night because they have a nightmare, you're able to call on the name of Jesus. The moments when you, you're given a bad doctor's report and you can't call pastor at the moment, you can't reach out the sister bounds, but you have to use the name of Jesus for yourself. It's small victories that lead to greater victories. David, David found himself before this man. And the Bible says that he pursued this man and he slung that rock and smote him and killed that giant. And the Bible says that David prevailed over Goliath with a sling and a rock. I know it was the rock, and I know it was a sling, but I come to enlighten you. It wasn't just only the sling and the rock, but it was the faithfulness of a man that showed up day after day and used what he had in private. It was the faithfulness and the availability of David that said, I'm in this for God and no one else. There is a call. Stand your feet, music can come. David. David broken. I'm sure he was pursuing that giant after a seed of confusion planted in him by Eliab, thinking that, oh, maybe God did not call me to kill Goliath. Maybe, maybe God, maybe God. Uh, maybe I'm just, I'm doing this out of my pride. But can I tell you, you've got to uh, silence the voices of your accusers here tonight. You've got to silence these things. Uh, because understand one thing, uh, that when God anoints you, you better be ready to fight. When God trusts you with the gospel, when God trusts you with the truth, you better be willing to go through the ups and downs. Uh, but there's got to be something, somebody in the Anchor Church that says, like David said, I don't care what my brothers think. I don't care what Saul thinks. But there is a cause. There is a giant to kill. Lift your hands towards heaven right now. You may be here tonight. And you may, may be back home. Like Pastor said on Sunday, this may be your, your new year. You may be new or you may not have been in here much longer. 
You may not know how to use the weapons God's given you, but all you need is a willing heart. All you need is faithfulness. All you need to do is have a made up mind that say, I'm willing to endure the test of time. I'm willing to do whatever God wants me to do. And God will perform miracles in your life. Folks, we got to trust in our private devotion. The sling and the rock was great, but it was those moments that the presence of God began to flood where that hill was, where he was. It was the moments that God began to speak to him and he began to write in the Psalms. We can't forget that the Psalms were prophetic. They were inspirational. But they were a journal of, God, of David's defeats and his victories. They were a journal of his, his fears and his failures. They were a journal of, a, of his anxiety. But, but at the end, he trusted in the rock. He trusted in the name of the Lord. He trusted in the presence of God. No matter how big the mountain was before him, no, how, no matter how scary the lion was or, or, or how big the giant was, he knew, I know a strength that's greater than anything that's set before me. I know something that I can put my feet on. I have a foundation to stand upon. your hands to the Holy Ghost. This altar is open. This altar is open for someone that wants to recommit their lives. Oh, you're not weary. You're not weak. You're just weary. You're not weak. You're just weary. Woo. Just because you're a weary warrior doesn't mean you're weak here tonight. Oh, just because you had some valleys in your life doesn't mean you're wearier tonight. If you just set your mind on God, God has a giant for you to kill. Come on, mom and daddy. You said God has a giant that he's called you to kill for your children. God has a giant. Before there's their lights. Is there not a cause? There's got to be a cause. You can't stop witnessing. You can't stop preaching. You can't stop playing the instrument. You can't stop that because of the opposition. But you got to keep putting one foot after another. you got to keep pressing towards the cause. Come on, church. I want you to pray right now. I want you to recommit a vow towards the Lord. God, bring me back to the old landmark. Oh, God, bring me back to old landmark. I won't be discouraged because I don't know how to use what you've given me, but God, I'm willing, God, I'm willing, God, I'm willing, because God, you call me to greatness. God, you call me to destiny. God, you call me to be great for you and your kingdom. Let your voice right now, let your voice right now, God is ministering unto somebody. Oh, you've been, people have been jealous of you. People have hated you. You've been lied upon, cheated upon. But God anointed you in the midst of the cheat. He anointed you in the midst of the jealousy. He anointed you when no one watched or was looking. <laughs>